going live. All right, and everybody stop minutes. talking back here because we're closest to the mic. So everyone, we're just, uh, as you know, we're not scheduled to start until 7.30, so we're just given a few minutes to get viewers in here uh, so we can start our episode three of Facebook Live with Nick White and my special guest, Dr. Brianna Horix. Where is everyone from in here today? Uh, comment your city and state below so we can see where you guys are from, everyone that's in here so far. Welcome, Denise. Uh, based off the cactus, the sun, and the cheeseburger, I'm gonna guess Arizona. Bristol, Virginia, welcome. We, uh, you're pretty close to our headquarters. Hello from New Hampshire, welcome. Never been to New Hampshire? Phoenix, Arizona. Auburn Hills, Michigan. We have Maine. Bobby is in the two-week board and oh, training in Boston right now. That's awesome. You will be very, very pleased. Miami. Uh, Miami. <laughs> I love going to Miami. Uh, Danielle, Manassas, Virginia. Very close as well. Currently in Stafford, originally from Indiana, half an hour from where e-collar is made. They are amazing people out of e-collar technologies, Pat. You should stop in sometime and see Greg Van Curren, who is the CEO of e-collar. How's the weather in Miami? It's probably better than here in Northern Virginia. <laughs> so again, guys, we're gonna probably start in about five minutes. So just stay with us. We're gonna get some, uh, some viewers in here and then we are going to get started. And we will be answering your training questions and some medical questions. Might have rain tonight. Yeah, we just got a bad storm. When was that, like two days ago? We had a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Is that five? So again, we will be uh, starting at 7.35 on the dot. So bear with us, grab a popcorn, grab a beer, put your dog in the place command, and get ready to rock out with us. I would like to thank Joe Zitzelberger for uh, technical support and Brandon Rogers. Tank Mosley is in the house. Welcome Tank. 
You have all three on place. That is wonderful, Laura. Sounds like Off Leash Canine trains your dogs. Uh, a quick shout out to Lola that is up in Lake Worth with Mike. Oh, nice. You're using Off Leash Canine uh, South Florida. Yours are both dead to the world. <laughs> Have uh, you guys, so when we go live here in about four minutes, um, think of some uh, dietary, medical, pretty much any questions. Um, Dr. Horrocks has gave us the amazing opportunity to be here for all of you guys at Off Leash Canine to answer your questions free of charge. You can't beat that. How many times can you have vets answer questions for free? <laughs> My vet doesn't even do that. <laughs> Oh my. Hi, Mom. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Horrocks. Happy to have you. Three minutes. Straight fire. <laughs> Giving a shout out to Lola, who is with Mike. Hopefully you're getting some awesome updates. I have three English Mastiffs. They're pretty good, but it would be cool to have them walk off leash. Chrissy, if you watch our over 1,700 before and after videos on YouTube, you will see off leash obedience is something that we are globally known for. Um, right now we actually have uh, Washington National star Jason Worth's uh, German short-haired pointer gunner and we have NHL all-star, NHL record holder, Caps player, uh, Justin Williams dog. Two minutes. Two minutes and we are ready to get this party started. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for being an inspiration. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Like I said, I do these Facebook Lives for you guys. You guys are awesome. You comment. You give us so much engagement. And um, it's my way to give back to all 240,000 of you is have uh, me personally answer your questions and have fun and talk shit and have good dialogue with everyone. Go Caps. Oh, the Caps are playing tonight, Joe. Mm -hmm. Mr. Game 7 himself. Mr. Game 7. <laughs> His dog is going to be as amazing as him. <clears throat> well, we got about one, two minutes? <coughs> about a minute. All right, guys, have some of your medical questions ready. Here in about a minute, we are going to go live and start knocking out some of these questions. And then Joe, I think once we go live, that's when. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right, guys, it is now 7.35 and we are going live, Facebook Live Off Leash Canine Training page with Nick White and my very, very special guest, Dr. Brianna Horrocks from Ferry Farm Animal Clinic. Animal Clinic in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So if anyone is in the Fredericksburg, Virginia area, you can come see Dr. Horrocks there um, for any of your dog, you guys just do dogs? We do dogs, cats, and exotics. Dogs, cats, or exotics. So there you go, pretty much covers everything. Um, so, Kind of, uh, the, the first thing I want to throw out there from a training perspective or a doctor, veterinarian, medical perspective is the questions you ask and the topics we are both going to discuss tonight, <clears throat> they're both going to be general information. 
Obviously, you can feel free to ask uh, questions about your dogs or issues you're having, and we will both do our best to give you general information and general feedback on those questions. But keep in mind that it's general information and neither one of us can give you specific, detailed, this is exactly what you need to do information um, without actually stopping into her office for an evaluation or coming into an off-leash canine training facility for an evaluation. So we're gonna provide, be providing you with general information, so take it for what it's worth uh, at that. Anything, Joe? Nothing yet. All right. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we get asked a lot about, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, I think both Facebook Live videos we've got asked about this topic that we've done, is anxiety. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys out there have anxious dogs, dog with separation anxiety, anxiety, noise, a, a bunch of different issues. We get asked about that at least, I don't know, 20 times a week probably. Um, every video I do on Facebook, we get asked about anxiety. So I think that's going to be one of the first topics we talk about. And um, if you guys have any questions about anxiety or your dog or you know general thoughts from a training perspective or a medical perspective, um, feel free to reach out and we will both do our best to answer those questions. All right, we have a question from Shannon. She wants to know, is there any hope for a dog with severe separation anxiety? I'll start with Dr. Horst. Yeah, um, I would say definitely. Um, usually what I like to recommend to my clients is behavioral modification for four to six weeks. If it's severe enough, we usually kind of use an additive like medication. Um, there's lots of different medications out there. Every dog is an individual and they react differently to different medications. Um, but I'm not usually an advocate for just medication. It usually does not work. Um, the medication is best used with behavior consults, like with Nick. Um, sometimes I do some consults too, and I can give little recommendations. It really does depend on the triggers. So if you have any specific triggers for separation anxiety, you know, for instance, um, a jingle of the keys or a garage door opening, um, especially in the winter time, you putting on a jacket that are triggers. Um, we tend to try to use desensitization techniques for four to six weeks. Um, there's lots of different things you can use with that as well. But usually if it's severe enough, I usually recommend going to a behaviorist or a trainer that can help with the codependency that your animal is exhibiting. Um, but I have had some really great success with trainers such as Nick. Um, so if you, if you really have a lot of questions with that, we can do consults and I would say go see Nick. And if you need to too, I can also add in medication that does help, but I, I again say that you need four to six weeks of behavioral modification before you will ever see any effects with any kind of drug too. Perfect. Um, for, uh, for doctor, uh, any, uh, are, are hives and allergies common in pit bulls? Yes. Okay. Um, allergies in general, um, wh where are they from? Uh, it's not listed. Oh. Right if you're here, from here, um, allergies are extremely common. Um, Virginia is in the top three um, of the worst state for allergies in general for both people and animals. So I see so many allergy cases on a regular basis, and now um, with the weather being as warm it is, as it is in December, I see seasonal allergies even in December. Um, but I, I see a lot of pit bulls with allergies, and um, we can definitely combat it. I usually like to start with short-term medication, but if it becomes an issue where, um, say, I'm putting the dog on prednisone all the time, I usually switch to long-term allergy meds. Um, my favorite is um, Apoquil. Um, it's a usually a really good preventative of actual itching. Um, a lot of success with that with a lot of different dogs. And then if that doesn't work, then I have a couple other things that I can recommend. But it's very common, yes. I actually, uh, my dog, just, I don't know, a week ago was just itching the shit out of himself <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I actually got prescribed Apoquil, oh, yeah. and I think within 48 hours yeah. I noticed 
a drastic yeah. decline and now all of his because he was scratching which was yeah. making it bleed and mm -hmm. licking his paws which was making it yeah. roll and <clears throat> literally within 48 hours I noticed a drastic difference so. well that's the great thing about Apoquil <laughs> is that what happens is in, you know you have to with allergies the main issue is that you are allergic to some allergen so then you have an inflammatory response to that allergen and so what the Apoquil does and it doesn't lower the immune system, which some other drugs do. This attacks the actual itch part of the inflammatory cycle. So it just takes away the feeling of their itch. So they don't form any secondary bacterial infections or skin infections or raw areas. Some dogs can get so severe, they form what I call lick granulomas. Basically, it's a fancy word of saying a thick area of an ulcer on their limb that get scar tissue built up and eventually it becomes such an issue you can't really get rid of those. So you like to catch it early so that your animal doesn't form any chronic issues like that. Very cool. Um, Kelsey wants to know how she can get her dog's coat to stay shiny. Oh, there you go. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I usually recommend um, DHA products or omega-3 fatty acids. There's lots of different products out there that have those fatty acids in them. Some people focus on omega-6s, but um, I've had more success with three, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, a good product that sometimes I see is Willactin. Um, it's a supplement that goes in their food daily. All right. How about uh, the Bordetella shot? How often should your dog get the Bordetella shot? The vaccine, um, excuse me. It really depends on the route. Um, I usually don't recommend intranasal anymore. We've kind of moved away from that. If you're getting, it depends too on the demeanor. If you know you, you have a dog that gets injectable, um, depending on whether you board or not, most of the time they will recommend every six months. Uh, we do offer a Bordetella that's oral now that that research has shown is yearly. So if you want a yearly Bordetella, go with oral. Okay, very cool. Um, is it true that vaccination should only be administered to healthy dogs? Um, there have been times where I've had to vaccinate an unhealthy dog. Um, it is true in a sense that vaccinations in general can lower the immune system a little bit because it, if you think about it in you know common sense scenario is when you give a vaccine, your immune system is getting used to that and it's making your immune system work harder. So if you're already sick and your immune system's working hard, then that vaccine is just gonna add to that problem. So I usually like to vaccinate healthy dogs, um, especially if they have a temperature I really don't like to. I usually wait two weeks until they're completely, you know, anything's resolved. It depends on the actual problem that's going on as well, but I, I don't usually. What is your take on, this is a good question for both of you guys, what is your take <clears throat> on raw diets? Mm. You want me to go first? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so. To, to, I'm gonna fucking be honest as I always am on here. That's why it's live and uncensored with Nick White, right? And special guest, Dr. Horrocks. Um, to be honest, I always say my advice on anything like that is I would consult your vet. That's what I always say because I don't know what your dog's weight is. I don't know what your dog should be. I, you know, I don't know any of those, again, specific things about your dog. Um, but based off what I do know, again, my non-medical, well, let me back up a little bit and I think she'll agree is I always tell people I say no matter how great you think I am as a trainer or anything I don't give medical advice and because it's usually probably wrong um, and don't take high-level training advice from your vet because it's probably wrong so I never try to give medical advice I say I would talk to your vet about that but again now that with that said uh, me personally the problem that I see a lot, whether it's clients or just out there in the dog world with raw diets, is people fuck it up a lot, I think. Um, I think they're not giving their dog enough of one thing, they're giving it too much. So, I mean, so it's hard for me to be, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I would say ask a vet and then do it correctly, but based off what I know from being in this field and working with thousands of dogs and dog owners uh, a year, I see a lot of people really mess it up, which then causes other issues because of it. So yeah. that's my training answer. And now yeah. the... Well, I'd agree, definitely. Um, so this is the problem is when you do raw diets and uh, in general homemade diets, um, there are nutrients that 
they maybe are not getting that they would get in a commercial food because that is food that has been tested. Um, if you were, my, my personal opinion is I try to steer away from those um, raw and homemade diets, but if you were going to go down that route, make sure you research it and talk to a nutritionist, really. Um, I have some owners that are completely gung-ho about it and they definitely only want to do that. And so what I recommend, if this is something that you must do, even though I don't recommend it, um, I usually point them in the direction of Virginia Tech. The, there's a nutritionist there that actually has a lot of information on homemade diets. She has calculated, formulated diets that she has come up with that have the proper nutrients. So if you are going to do that, you have to make sure you research it and do it properly. Um, and the Virginia Tech nutritionist is a really great resource with that. Very cool. Awesome. Uh, doctor, what are your thoughts on e-collars and e-collar training? Well, I took my dog to Nick, so <laughs> <laughs> that's actually. I'd say my opinion's exactly like his. <laughs> we get a lot of uh, people asking if it will burn the dogs of the neck, and now, have you ever experienced that? I have never that? experienced that, and I actually have had a couple clients come in to me that have gone to see Nick that before their dog you know was going to him for training um i actually didn't even tell you about this <laughs> that i was going to before this but um dr hart actually my co-worker he had a client that came here and he you know before the dog went here um the dog was out of control bouncing off the walls and then after they saw nick the, the dog was like a complete transformation and there's i've never seen any you know, result of any burns or anything harmful to the dog whatsoever. And that's actually a good topic to, to talk about really fast is, mm -hmm. you know, we get, you know, people or people on the internet out there, you know, because everyone on the internet's an expert, as everyone knows, is they'll say, oh, the e-collar, you know, burn my dog's neck or, you know, the e-collar, I read about that. But to my knowledge, an e-collar has never burned a dog's neck in e-collar training world history, um, which shows you the people who didn't know they were doing to begin with. Um, it's usually training errors, like leaving the e-collar on too long, leaving the e-collar on too loose, and now prolonged uh, duration, and too loose is the prongs rub back and forth, which causes like a raw rubbing irritation, but to an uneducated person who thinks they're an expert, they take it off and say, oh, it burned a dog's neck. Um, we've trained military dogs, law enforcement dogs, regular chihuahuas. I've never in my entire life seeing e-collar burn a dog's neck. It's literally impossible unless the e-collar malfunction malfunctions like a you know a Samsung Galaxy 7 or something. That's <laughs> that's the only way it's it, now Samsung's gonna sue me, but <laughs> that's that's Welcome. the only way it's possible is if it causes a malfunction. But the training or the collar itself, short of a malfunction, it's literally impossible. And sadly we've had people say the vet told me the collar burned their really? dog's neck. Yeah, we haven't. We've, we've, uh, we've had that. Yeah, well, and I'm like, that. well, and then I default back to my what I said earlier yeah. is stick to your vet for medical stuff, yeah. and stick to me for training stuff. Don't ask me vet stuff, and don't ask them training stuff because neither yeah. one of us usually know what we're talking about. That's why they're a vet and I'm a trainer, yeah. and that's why I'm a trainer and they're a vet. Yeah. Well, um, there's been many times where I've had people come in and ask me training advice that maybe I wasn't completely comfortable with and i'd say well you know here's a card here's a number call this person you know because that's the thing we have to know our expertise so very cool um real quick catherine says thank you for your service nick you oh, earned the you, you, you earned the right to drop f-bombs so. <laughs> thank you catherine for giving me that all uh, right and dr uh, julian wants to know if you recommend vitamins or or and hip joint vitamins for cane corsos or any dog on the regular basis um, yeah, um, for that kind of breed too, um, I sometimes recommend starting them at age five. Um, and joint supplements are completely 100% safe. So if that's something that she wants to add in, she most definitely can. It does not hurt. Okay, very cool. Um, Joe wants to know what dog food you recommend, if you have any recommendations. Um, for a particular dog food that I like? Yeah. Like a brand? A brand, oh, specific brand. so many out there. Well, really, what do you feed give, your dog? Give us a couple good ones. Um, well, I feed my dog Taste the Wild, oh, but good. they're spoiled. <laughs> um, if you're, you know, it depends on what you want to spend, really. I mean, you have a product like Taste the Wild that's more expensive, but I've never had a problem with it, and my dog's 
do really well on it and I find that they don't gain weight on it. Um, if, if I had to pick a product that was maybe, you know, something that was affordable but really good, um, Purina products like ProPlan in particular, um, Hills products, you know, the, the great thing about those is if you end up having a problem like your dog ends up having liver disease or pancreatitis, with that kind of brand, you can go to veterinary prescription diets then and put them on that specific brand that's more veterinary prescription that is care, you know, safe for that dog. I mean, there's tons of products out there too. And if your dog, you know, has a weight issue, there's certain, you know, um, prescription diets out there that are for weight management, etc. It really de does depend on the edge of individual dog and what's going on with that dog in that life stage. Awesome. Um, Chrissy wants to know uh, what's the best way to pinpoint a food allergy. She heard that blood tests don't always show food allergies. Blood tests don't show food allergies at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, food allergies are really difficult to kind of pinpoint. Um, they're kind of a, um, a diagnosis of exclusion, really. If you have a food allergy, they can look very similar to like a seasonal environmental allergy. So a lot of the times if it's not seasonal and it's year round, I kind of think it's maybe food allergy. Um, they tend to lick their paws a lot like an environmental allergy, but there's different areas on the skin that can be irritated that kind of can pinpoint you into that right direction. Um, but you can always, if other medications aren't working at all, you can always do a food trial where you do a veterinary prescription diet only um, with a kind of a hypoallergenic diet for about six to eight weeks. And that, you know, then you'd be able to figure out whether there was an improvement in the skin. Um, and then the, another kind of pitfall that some people kind of fall under is that they think that if they get a grain-free diet, it'll fix the food allergy. It doesn't. The, the animals are actually allergic to the proteins in the diet. So common proteins like chicken, beef, salmon, sadly. So if you ever think, you know, if you don't want to go to a veterinary prescription diet, if you ever think, well, maybe my dog has a food allergy, try to stick to a novel protein and a novel carb source. Um, obscure ones, this is kind of why I like Taste the Wild, is they have stuff available like caribou or bison. You can try and see if changing to those really obscure protein sources improves their skin. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Any medical reason why dogs constantly chase their tails? <laughs> <laughs> no, it really does depend on the dog. <laughs> it could be a playful. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh, tail chasing questions. <laughs> uh, what's your opinion on Royal Canine dry dog food? Or I love Royal Canine. Yeah, we what... actually have Royal Canine at our practice. They, um, I find really great they're a really great brand, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, I think it was interesting um, about the uh, the shiny coat question. I think someone uh -huh. asked. Do you generally do you see like is there a specific like a uh, the tablets or just the oil um, drip or does you know, it really honestly, matter? Honestly, there are so many products out there. They have um, they have powder. They have liquid that can go actually in the food. Um, they have different types of shampoo, really. So oh. you can do topical remedies or you can do oral. I personally think the oral, I have found better results with oral stuff. So whether it's powder or liquid or tablets, some of them come in tablets, I find that oral works a little bit better. Um, I only use shampoos in scenarios of allergies, really. So uh, One thing that I personally thought was the most genius invention um, since the slice of bread. Uh -huh. When I recently went to the vet and I was gonna talk to you about it, I was like, is this real? Like, this is crazy, I never heard about this. Is a uh, pill, a chewable, uh -huh. that's like a three month uh, flea medication. Yeah, Provecto, it's the new product out. Yeah, yeah, like who out there knew that you can give your dog a single chew? I literally, I just learned this when I, I told you earlier, I took my dog to the vet because he was scratching and had allergies. Well, they were like, how is he on his flea medication? I live on 16 acres, so I'm like, yeah, he probably needs some more. Um, and they're like, you want the, the liquid or the chewable? And I'm like, what do you mean, like, what's the chewable do? And they're like, oh, it's like the size of a quarter. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, you just give him this, it tastes good, it tastes like beef or something, and he chews it, and he's set for the next three months. Yeah. Did you guys know that? No. See, like all my yeah. trainers here are looking at me in awe. Yeah. 
Uh, well, it's like, a that's I mean, amazing. It is. It's a matter of opinion, but my personal opinion, and this is only my opinion, um, is that I like oral medication better in dogs for flea tick prevention. Wow. Um, I found that some of the topicals, I have owners that swear they put it on every month and they still get fleas. Um, it really does depend on the product you're using, so I'm not bashing any of the topicals. We do sell topicals, but um, I do prefer the oral, and if it's any constellation, I switch to my dog to Perfecto, too. <laughs> now, can you, <laughs> so you buy, buy my dogs on it? Then. <laughs> can you buy those in tip, uh, regular big no. market pet stores? You have to go to the vets for those, for the I'm oral? I'm not really sure. I don't think so, really. I think you have to go to a vet to get that okay. product. A lot of times, the products that you sometimes find elsewhere, you don't know how they're stored. You don't know what product it is. It could be last year's product. You never know. So you're probably better off going to a vet for those kinds of products anyways. Very cool. Um, Laura wants to know, will the omega-3 uh, help with shedding also? Um, it can, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, we'll go one up. Uh, is coconut oil beneficial from dogs? That's from Esther. Um, I have had some owners try that, but with minimal success. So I would probably stick to an actual product that's specific with the omega-3 and for that for your dog. Any opinions on the From brand food? F R double M. Um, F R O double. I haven't heard of it. Okay. Gosh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be like you now, and if I haven't heard of it, it's probably <laughs> not wonderful. I mean, it's probably you know pretty good. But I don't know it, know it very well, but I usually know some of the really good products out there. So if I don't know it, sorry. Franco's dogs actually like eating fish. Um, wants to know if that's good for the omega. Fish as in raw or fish as in diet? I would assume he's. Uh, I would assume. I legit mean, fish, fish oil is yeah. okay. Um, I'm not sure with, you know. Um, a legit fish. Yeah, an actual <laughs> fish. But fish oil, if you can find it in a product, is really good. So take your fish, Franco, and just squeeze it <laughs> over the bowl and you're set. <laughs> uh, Lori, Lori, personal question. Lori wants to know what kind of dogs you guys have, if you have any. You want to go first? Uh, I personally have a Belgian Malinois who's pretty amazing, uh, bite dog, drug dog, tracking dog, deer recovery dog, therapy dog. Um, so he's pretty awesome. He's getting up there now, he's about eight years old, but he's a Malinois so he's still the equivalent of like yeah. a seven month old regular oh. breed dog. So, <laughs> uh, but that, so I have a Belgian Malinois. Ooh, me. Well, I have lots of dogs um, because I'm a vet and I rescue lots of dogs. <laughs> um, so I have two German Shepherds. One was trained by Nick. Um, she's three. Um, and my newest addition to the family is an 11 week old long haired black German Shepherd, which will come to Nick as well. <laughs> um, then I have four African Basenjis um, and two Canary Islands hounds. They're called Podangos. Um, the one I rescued when I was over there doing an internship and so I rescued them. They actually have a really huge problem with a lot of the hunters in the Canary Islands abusing the dogs so of course I brought two of them back with me. <laughs> so um, and then I also have a pit bull so I have lots of dogs. Awesome. <laughs> Got a awesome. pack. I do. I have a pack. <laughs> so here's a good one. Um, dogs that eat their own poop. Is this oh. training related or is this medical related um both right yeah i mean it can be both it really it a does dietary depend. deficient sometimes? it can be they sometimes can eat you know their own poop if they maybe feel deficient in minerals it's kind of an instinct thing um my dogs don't eat their own poop but they eat horse poop for some reason so you know I, i've always kind of wondered why i mean it's really gross it's it's probably more of it you know kind of an issue that you have it's not going to hurt your dog any um but usually it can either be a mineral deficiency or a behavioral thing really, so it really does depend. I can tell you it uh, can be fixed through training for yeah. sure, we get that a lot and it's yeah. actually a very easy issue to deal with, but to take a step back from that, first I would consult a vet or a dietitian yeah. to see <laughs> if there's a, a medical or deficient, because maybe, yeah. alright we fixed it through training, but now the deficiency is still in the dog and now it goes on for a prolonged period of time, yeah. so I would want it checked out. Um, even if it's fixed through training, still yeah. to make sure that your dog's getting everything they need. Yeah, I mean, you can always get like a, a health check screening and maybe, a, you know, a round of blood work just to make sure that it's nothing. You know, some, some endocrine diseases can do that as well. 
Um, and then if there's something else, you know, we call it pica when they eat other inanimate, inanimate objects. So that's something that I also have, you know, we get a lot where it's not poop, it's something else like concrete slabs, just anything really. Um, so what you do is you do a blood screening just to make sure everything's okay. And then if it continues, then you refer to Nick. <laughs> so same answer for urine then? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we have a good one here. I like this one. Uh, I have two two year old yellow lab, and he's very hyper. So I want to know how old will he be when he finally gets calm. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, if you, if, I don't know if you just came in here, uh, but if you go back four minutes, uh, someone asked what my personal dog was, and I said I have a Belgian Malinois, and I've resided to the fact that he's not going to be calm until he literally dies. So he's eight years old and he's still crazy and high energy and will run and bite and detection and track. And so to answer your question, probably unfortunately the answer you may not be looking for, um, it, it may never go away. You know, it, you may have a 10 year old lab that's still a high energy dog. And I don't know, again, it, it's kind of a multi part answer, but yeah. uh, maybe you got them from a working line uh, lab breeder, which that alone makes uh, an astronomical difference if, if it's a working line lab. So it may never be that calm, you know, house therapy dog that, that you're looking for. Um, and, and the funny thing is, I think in my last Facebook live video, I talked about people always ask me from a training perspective, they say, what's the best dog to get? What's the best breed? And my answer that a lot of people don't like is it's kind of a indirect answer but it's just true is I say there's no perfect dog or perfect breed it's what breed or what dog is perfect for you so for example maybe you're a person that wanted a therapy dog or the dog to chill around the house and be lazy and lay on the couch but you got a lab from a working line lab breeder so now you got a crazy lab or someone else we run in both these scenarios all the time is they'll say, oh, I got this German Shepherd and I want him to do protection, I want him to do this and this. And then we meet him and I'm like, where'd you get this dog? And they tell me the name and I'm like, well, that's a show breeder that you got it from. That's not a working line breeder. Um, so to answer, that's the long answer to your very short question. But where I'm going with it is dog dependent, your two year old lab, you may be asking this question when he's eight and you know, Facebook Live 479, <laughs> saying, hey, that lab is eight now, and he's still just as crazy, just like my Malinois. So um, really all you can do, like with my Mal, and like we do with police dogs and military dogs and other working line dogs, is you can never make them calm. You can just control it using obedience and give using obedience and protection and detection and tracking, give them an outlet for that crazy energy, which by the nature of it makes them more calm when they're back chilling at your house because they just did a two mile track or they just did bite work for an hour. So you just have, if you have a dog like that, you just have to mitigate it, whether it's using a treadmill or, you know, exercising or getting them in a sport. So that's kind of the long answer to your question, if that helps. Awesome. Um, doctor, do you have any uh, recommendations on pet insurance? Oh, there you go. That's actually oh, a good question that yeah, I want to know. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'd like to know I that. know <laughs> a lot about that, but my practice has a lot of pamphlets about it. I mean, my, my biggest advice, I, I don't know a lot of specifics for each insurance company. You have to do that research on your own, but I do recommend it. Um, and I recommend it at a young age because a lot of insurance companies don't cover your animal if they develop a disease and then you want to get coverage. So if it's ever something that you want to consider, I mean, the problem is you're kind of gambling. You never know what your animal's going to do. It's just like a child. You know, your animal could get injured at any minute or get a really bad disease, um, especially with some of our chronic endocrine diseases. We get that a lot. Um, but... What I would recommend is if it's something that you're interested in, do a lot of research on it and find the insurance company that fits you um, and talk to them and research and then, you know, you know, get some workups and pamphlets about it. And if you have a puppy and you want to start that, then I would start it sooner rather than later. That way you get full coverage and you get the best thing for your buck. And the good thing is, if you like your medical plan, you get to keep it, too. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, what's your recommendation on putting weight on a dog? She rescued one uh, severely starved. 
two-year-old German Shepherd, weighs 47 pounds wow. when she rescued her, so she needs to put some weight on her. Any recommendations? So, um, I had this with my second Pedenko. Um, she was actually a YouTube sensation, really. Um, <laughs> she was thrown down a 120-foot cave, and she was there for oh, two wow. weeks with a fracture, and she was skin and bones, was only fed bread for seven years of her life. Um, part of the reason why I rescued her, I wanted to rescue her because I knew that she was going to be one of those animals that I didn't think was going to be adoptable. She was skin and bones when I got her. Um, what I did was I did dry food and wet food with her. Um, high protein. They have um, wet food out there that's high protein. Puppy is usually what I recommend, the puppy food. Um, with some of my bitches that are pregnant or nursing, I recommend that the owners, to keep the weight on them, feed them high calorie, high protein puppy food that's wet, and I combine the wet and dry. Awesome. Uh, what the same protein powder? What do you think of that? Uh, like, human protein powder? No, no, no. Oh. They, I've, I've had a board and train oh. specifically mm -hmm. where they wanted protein powder sprinkled on, you on can do that the food. As well. Yes. Well, I did, of course, yeah. but I just wanted, I was just curious about it. I was um, just making sure it wasn't some gym guy. Like whey protein yeah, from GSC. Like, oh, can I use it? Can I just that, dump that some that of my supplements? That on, yeah. Yeah, that on yeah, protein. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, here's a really, really good question, I, and I'm really curious about your answer on this. Uh, we hear so many different things about neutering. When's the best age to do it? <laughs> I knew I was going to get that question. It depends on the dog. Um, do we know what breed of dog it is? Uh, I do not see it in here. Do you? Okay. So uh, I'll just, just give a generalized general general general, answer. Yeah. Um, with a lot of my larger, man, there's, so there's a lot of research out there that's conflicting. Um, a lot of vets are on one side and other vets Increased are on the other. Cancer, well, chance. so it's a lot of different things. So I'll kind of start. <laughs> um, with giant breeds, I usually try to recommend as close to a year. Um, if they're smaller, I mean, I have neutered dogs at four to six months. Um, it really does depend on the breed, though. Um, there's research out there that does recommend doing it sooner rather than later, both for females and males, um, because of the risk that you take if you don't, you know, they get certain types of cancers. Um, for instance, if you have a male, they can get prostate cancer if you keep them unneutered. Um, it's not as much of a problem in males as it is females. But then there's some research out there with giant breeds, like Great Danes or anything like that, that if you neuter them at a younger age, they are a little more prone to arthritis, um, be, you know, because their growth plates, they say that your growth plates, you know, they close sooner. Um, they have more of a tendency and prevalence of that with the research comparing when neutered dogs at a young age versus like maybe over a year they had more prevalence of arthritis in the younger dogs. I've always been the person that recommends it maybe a little bit sooner. Um, I like it under a year. I usually recommend 10 to 12 months for giant breeds, around six to eight months for middle-sized <coughs> um, you know, dogs, just because that is what I've found to be the most successful, especially with behavior, because behavior with a neutered male can start to get out of control. And if that is the case, then my recommendation is to neuter <clears throat> sooner rather than later before that behavior becomes a learned behavior Correct. and it becomes a problem. Right. Awesome. Do you have a question? I do, I but gonna... feel free. Yeah, to add to that, like something we get, we get a lot, uh, not a lot, but um, people will say like, I have a three-year-old insert uh -huh. breed here he's yeah. killed a dog and attacked four other dogs and i'm gonna get him neutered so he like stops doing that yeah. and we and i i just want to see your opinion i'm like that's not gonna fix that no, it's, it won't right, because yeah. it's a learned behavior Correct. at that point once they learn that behavior it it's so if you have the problem yeah. it's too late essentially yeah, exactly. for well for a medical yeah, i mean if you notice it at four months of age where like they're marking in your house then yeah. you can maybe bank on that you know changing okay Maybe they don't have the, the tendency to want to do that it's not as much. Set yet. Uh huh. But I mean, even then, you two know, years old, he's attacked a few dogs. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to get him to calm down. Like that's yeah. the question we get a lot, I mean, and we honestly, always say like, "All right, so go get him neutered, and then when he still attacks another dog, call yeah. us again for training." So. I mean, I, at that point, I'd say, well, it doesn't 
you know, that's not going to fix your problem, but neuter your dog anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to look at it, yeah. Uh, I have a really good question here. Winter um, months are coming, snow's coming, salt salt oh, is going to be on question. the roads, on the yeah. sidewalks, uh -huh. dogs' paws mixed with salt. What do you think? Booties, the, uh, the little uh, shoes, what do you think? Yeah, um, do, you know, if your dog doesn't have a problem, my motto is if the dog doesn't have a problem, don't make it a problem. So if they are fine and their paws don't get irritation, then you're fine. If answer. they do, then you can get those booties and they've tons of booties out there that they sell at PetSmart or Petco that are really great. I haven't had a problem with any of them. Um, thoughts on uh, feeding dogs uh, deer organs, whether it's raw or, or dehydrated? Um, the only reason I would say definitely not is parasitic okay. tendency. They can get parasites from them and you know I just would Thanks, say to steer clear away from that. Yeah, just that was Tank's it. question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we just Thanks, to like I should have asked that before last night. <laughs> <laughs> Any another question or no? Yeah, uh, we have a German Shepherd puppy scheduled for training with Tank. Oh. Uh, when we get him neutered at a year old, will he know his training still? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's all relevant. You yes. Know, I, I can actually speak to that from a training perspective. I, that is a topic I have a little bit of knowledge in. And from a training perspective, uh, that's, so that's actually a good question. Because yeah. we get it a lot. People will say, I want to sign up my dog for your boarding train. I want to sign up my dog for lessons. He is neutered. or he Generally, it's he's not neutered. That's generally the, the, the approach we get is, He's not neutered, and we want to sign up for your two-week board and train, but I want to see if that'll have any impact on the training. I've trained a shit ton of neutered dogs, a shit ton of non-neutered dogs, and I've never been able to tell the difference. From a working dog perspective, I've worked with working dogs who were neutered, working dogs who weren't neutered, and I can say I personally um, have never been able to tell the difference between the, the, the two. So that's my answer from a training perspective. Yeah. Well, I have the same. Would agree. Yes. Well, there you go. Totally. So, um, so what's at your uh, practice, I guess, or the veterinarian clinic? What's what if there is one? What is a, a like? What do you see the most essentially? What would you say is we Cases? see this the most? Oh, this sorry. issue or this problem? Okay. Or? Well, it really does depend on the doctor, really. Um, so I see the most. I'd have to say allergies, especially for Virginia. It's just because of our location, really. And why is that? Do you, is it just um, you know, Dr. Witter, the he's the practice or? owner. Yeah, that, um, he gave me a huge paper on it, but it's a lot of dif the different types of allergens that cause irritation. We have more of them than other, and it's partly our weather, too. We have lots of really hot summers, but then we have drastic winters, so we definitely, I think the weather plays a part in it as well. Um, and then if I had to pick another one, um, I tend to, well, each of us is a little bit different. We all tease each other. Um, a couple of uh, my coworkers get you know, Dr. Hart, he's definitely the orthopedist. You know, he does a lot of orthopedic stuff, so he tends to get more of that. Um, I tend to be an, the dermatologist, and I do a lot of internal medicine stuff. Um, Dr. Foster, who is the other female vet, she does a lot of that too. We get a lot, of, we tend to get more of the train wrecks, her and I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but. Um, and then the other prevalence too is a lot of, a lot of wounds. I get wounds all the oh, time. Yeah. Lacerations from anything, dog fights or, you know, my dog just went outside and it came back with this gaping gash, you know, in its side and what do I do, you know, that kind of thing. All right, uh, we have, this is a really good question. Um, we have a lot of great questions. Yeah, they, they <laughs> have been. Uh, what are the negative side effects of taking a dog away from the mother and litter mates at a uh, too young of an age? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, um, do they give I think you that specific may be a training age? question. Well, that's more of a training yeah, question. My take on it too would be, I mean, it depends on really when, um, and it depends on whether they're going to keep the puppies. I mean, if it's six weeks, then that's fine. If it's a couple days, then they, you know, they need to make sure that they're supplementing those puppies with proper nutrition. Um, and then also it can, you know, I have a dog, Ruby, the one that I rescued that was abused, um, and she definitely has this crazy motherly ability. And, <laughs> And I feel like she had puppies and, you know, uh, she looks like she had puppies the way her you know, mammary glands look. And she, I think they must have taken her babies from her because she has this real tendency of, 
you know, mothering her stuffed animals and stuff, and I feel bad for her because I feel like that does take an emotional toll on them, and she does remember it. like a person. (laughs) She does, I mean, because there's times where she definitely hoards her babies, and so I think that both for emotional standpoint on the bitch and then the puppies for nutrition, I don't think it's a really good idea, but it also depends on when. Yeah, I mean, but, but you age. probably have more expertise on that than I do. Yeah, uh, and and someone fact check me on this because um, I'm not a hundred percent confident, <laughs> but I think I'm ninety eight percent confident. But again, fact check me on it because the uh, breeding and re- proper raising of litters that's not my expertise. I've never claimed to be an expert in that. But with that said, I believe in Virginia, Virginia state law, it's actually illegal to take a, a, a puppy away from the uh, uh, from them prior to eight weeks. So I think it's actually uh, a Virginia state law at eight weeks that a breeder cannot remove the, the puppies from, from the mom at that point. I'm not sure if it's eight weeks, but I think, yeah. Yeah, I know there's a Virginia state law where, yeah. I think it's eight weeks, but really? someone fact check that and comment in, yeah, so that way that. it's actually informed <laughs> knowledge and not my thought. Uh-huh. Um, so that's that. But then the second thing is you can definitely run into a lot of training problems and we see them like they have like bite inhibition. That's one of the big ones yeah. that we see where they didn't have enough time interacting with their litter mates to learn yeah. bite inhibition, yeah. which essentially bite inhibition is like the dog trainer nerd term for it. But essentially what it is is the dog not properly controlling its play biting essentially. Like it bites actually hard versus like the mouthing and it's because they didn't have enough time to interact with their litter mates. Um, Cause when they interact with the litter mates, what happens when puppy A bites puppy yeah. B a little too hard, puppy B goes ah! and yelps and then the mom comes over and like snatches them up. So that's how the dogs learn how to properly control their bite. So we see issues like that with um, dogs that were removed too young. So, but someone fact checked that, but I think it's Virginia state law. It is eight weeks. It Look is. at that. Wow. Okay. Look, I am an expert in this field after all. You know, that's um, so bad because I get like six week old puppies in. Exactly. Yeah. And we get that all the time. Like, I, and I mean, obviously I can't really, I mean, I can't really do anything about that because it's not my place. Really. Correct. I mean, they're the, the owner of that dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I get six week old puppies. <clears throat> yeah. And we, we actually had a dog. We actually had a dog. Um, a while back that it you can find the video on YouTube a dog named Doris a Doberman you'll see her before video super skittish I literally in the before video reach out to touch her she jumps back yelps like just really skittish then you'll see her after video which is amazing but don't want to plug that too much um, but if you watch her video the day I got her I'm like all right something's off with this dog so literally I reached out um, to the owner they just dropped it off for a board and train I'm like Hey, by chance, like, wh- like, what's the issue with this dog? Did you meet the parents? Because there's uh, genetic predisposition in dogs, just like in people. You know, I say your great grandpa's an alcoholic, your yeah. grandpa's an alcoholic, your dad's an alcoholic. You're not that you will be, but you're more inclined. Yeah. So the same with dogs, and they're like, no, the parents were fine. We met them. They were friendly. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what age? And same, they literally got the dog from the breeder at like yeah. five yeah. weeks old. So. So, um, so just to clarify on that, there are three states that mandate that that law, and okay. that's Maine, Virginia, Wisconsin, uh, okay. for eight weeks old. Yeah. So uh, again, I was right. Virginia, it is eight weeks old that you cannot legally a breeder cannot get rid of a dog and separate them prior to eight weeks, which I think is a that's fucking amazing law like that. that more than four yeah. states should have. Every state should have. I'm a huge advocate of leaving um, the litter with the parents until eight weeks. Great question. Um, Jamie wants to know, uh, my German Shepherd seems to be very long and lean. At what age do they normally fully fill out? Um, Well, it also depends on whether you neuter them or spay them Mm -hmm. too. Um, Their metabolism goes down a little bit after that happens. So they may be long and lean because they're still intact. Um, Usually right around a year, they should be filling out. And if you do have them neutered as well, they tend to gain weight because their metabolism goes down. Very cool. Uh, would you recommend to put in a doggy first aid kit at training facilities, I'm assuming? That's your well, yeah, I mean, that's, me, um, I mean, yeah, it certainly won't, wouldn't hurt, yeah. but I don't think that he'd have a problem with that. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, Unless the dog had an actual medical condition, then I don't, you know... Nick's yeah. not doing would, anything that he'll need that for. <laughs> no, yeah, we have never needed one. I actually, it obviously doesn't hurt for sure. I actually have a question. 
Okay. Uh oh. <laughs> Joe Zitzelberger, everyone give him a round of applause. He's <laughs> okay. commentating this and he has a question. All right, so I've trained a lot of great Danes. Okay. And I hear a lot about getting their stomach stapled at a. At oh, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. For um, the flipping and yeah, bloat and all that stuff. Yeah, it's called GDV. Mm -hmm. um, fancy word, uh, basically gastric volvulus. What happens is that deep-chested dogs, um, German shepherds too, they tend to be prone to it. Um, there is actually no known cause. It just sometimes happens in deep-chested dogs. There's no, oh, no, I mean, some people argue about the preventions of it, but honestly, it can really happen. It happened to my dog. And, um, you know, I regretted not doing this actually. Most of the time, um, especially if it's a female, I will spay them and I will tack their stomach at the same time because you're going in their abdomen. There is no reason you shouldn't do that. I would highly recommend it in Great Danes only because I see it so often with Great Danes as a problem. And the, the reason that I recommend that is once you get GDV can be such an emergency because it can happen very acutely and within an hour you could have a dog that was dead. I mean, I don't wow. want to scare anybody, but you can. So what happens is their stomach distends with air. And then because of that error, it'll, it's like a balloon, it allows it to flip. And because of that, you're cutting off blood supply to that stomach so you get a you know, necrotic stomach and you're also, you can tear blood vessels in the spleen. So my German Shepherd, Anya, she literally was outside for an hour, came back in, I saw her, she was panting, she vomited, and I knew exactly what was going on. I rushed her to the vet and within an hour and a half, she was already in surgery and her, all of her vessels to her spleen had torn and wow. I had to remove her spleen. Wow. Um, I took her to CARE, which is actually a really good emergency hospital in town, and I worked with the vet there. But um, So I decided that with my 11-week-old German Shepherd puppy, I will be tacking <laughs> her stomach. <laughs> okay. Um, Nick, probably a question for you. Okay. Uh, I have a Husky. She's part wolf and Siberian. Uh, I heard when they turn two years old, they turn dangerous. <laughs> I, I, I was going to already say, if, as, soon as, the, as soon as the question said I heard yeah. when they turn two years old, I was already getting ready to say false, but he finished the question too. Yeah. Go ahead and debunk that. Um, yeah. So false, as I was going to say before he finished the question. Um, any, and why I was going to say that is anytime someone says, I heard when German shepherds or when pit bulls or... It's always bullshit because um, you can't generalize anything in the world of dog training. Um, it's just, it would literally, again, it's live and uncensored. It would literally be like me starting a question with, I heard that white people, and no matter what you say, it's not going to apply to 80% of people. Um, so it's the same with dog training. But yeah, that, that's complete bullshit. Um, no dog turns aggressive. Um, it's generally, it's, it's breeding. It's, uh, again, genetic predisposition, or a lot of times it's under-socialized or not ongoing socialized, meaning they socialized when it was a puppy, they moved down the middle of nowhere. Um, like now, a perfect example, I used to live really close, literally a mile from my facility, I always had people over. Well, now I live yeah. 45 minutes away, I have 16 acres, so I don't have people over. So if my Mao now grew up at eight weeks in that country environment where not many people's over i may have vision. i mean obviously i would still do the right things and take them out places because i know but most people don't so um there as long as you keep your dog socialized and it's trained you'll you'll never have an issue regardless of breed pit bulls rot what people's like why is it the pit bulls are so i'm like they're not aggressive they're they're no more aggressive than any other dog how most of the dogs we see that are aggressive aren't pit bulls um i mean yeah. we get a lot of labs that are aggressive we get german shepherds that are aggressive but then we get a lot of them that aren't aggressive too but anytime we have any issue with aggression i've never once in seven years of owning the business and training a few dogs and a few clients over those seven years in 88 locations, I've never once said, oh, your dog's this way because it's a pit bull, yeah. or your dog's this way because he's a two-year-old husky. That's never the answer. It's never breed related. It's always, all right, why is he, when did he get like this? And you can pinpoint, you yeah. can start trailing, like, all right, so for a year he wasn't socialized because you lived in the middle of nowhere, or um, he wasn't socialized when he was a puppy because you got him and lived in the middle of nowhere. Or, yeah, we met his, I've even, I've literally had this. I'll say, did you meet the parents when you got him as a puppy? And they'll say, yeah, we met the dad or we met the mom, but they muzzled him. 
they, they yeah. had to have a muzzle because he was literally. I we've had that. I'm like, well, there you go. There, there's your there. That that's your solution. Yeah. So I'm um, completely debunked. The breed is irrelevant. Whether it's dog aggression, people aggression, any of those aggressions, the breed is 100% irrelevant when it comes to that. And if anyone tells you different, they're full of shit. <laughs> Okay, and I just want to say really quickly, if I'm skipping over your question, it's because the doctor and Nick has covered it before, uh, earlier in the video, so that's why I'm skipping. You can go back once this is up and, and watch it to hear your answer. Uh, let's see, I just had one right here. Uh, kind of going back, doctor, to the uh, taking the uh, puppies too early. Uh, one gentleman in here said that it was because, in his case, he had to take his puppy at four weeks old because uh -huh. the mother actually stopped feeding the puppy. Is there any reason why something like that would happen? Um, you know, I've had this happen before with some of my bitches, um, and I'm not saying that like a customer, that's their call. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanna make sure people didn't think that. Um, you know, it, I, honestly, it's very individualistic to the particular Situation. animal and situation you know it could be that she feels a little stressed in her environment and therefore she starts to wean them early um it could be that she has you know every just like every human mother every dog is different and some of them have more motherly instincts than <laughs> others and so sometimes it could be that scenario too i've had that a couple times as well So like anything, there will always be exceptions to the rule, but in general, eight weeks are up. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts, because we see this a lot as trainers, so I assume you guys have to see it way more than us. What percentage, and it may be low, I'm just throwing it out there, out of dogs you see, would you would you say at your clinic you consider overweight? Oh, God. <laughs> oh wow. If you had to throw a percentage, yeah. a general um, number out. 75%. So it kind of like people in America as well, yeah, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so seventy-five percent of dogs are, and from your experience, would you say it's a dietary issue, overfeeding, underexercising, overfeeding and underexercising? Like, is there a general answer you can give, or not really? Unfortunately, I have a perfect answer. This oh, time. awesome! Um, it's usually the owner's fault, really. Of course, a lot of yeah. Times. Um, yeah. And more of my issue is. Um, I hate to say it, but a lot of the wives out there do a really great job, but it's the husbands that are the problem. Oh, really? Because I they, thought the wives would be the soft No, ones. every time, every time I get an overweight dog and the, the wife comes in, she's like, my husband refuses to stop feeding my animal table food. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. A lot of the times... Be a better cook. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the times it's table food and, or treats, you know, yeah, they, just treating um, the shit the owners out of don't them. always understand that... You know, you can break one treat up and use it over the entire day. Correct. Where they'll give like a treat every time their dog goes outside. And so it's treats and table food that are the main issue. It would be like me eating like a bowl of ice cream yeah. every time I did well, something yeah. well. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I certainly can't do that. So yeah. like, exactly. So I, a lot of the times it's owner error really that causes obesity. And they don't, you know, some of it can be as well overfeeding but then they come in you know I've done a lot of weight management and I've had some owners really listen and they we've seen a lot of really good results but others can't quite understand that table food is just not meant for their dog another uh, really good question here from Laura um, should you wait until a certain age to run with your dog oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah I you know I, I tend to wait until they've been at least you know neutered or fully mature um, just because you know, I've had some early injuries with growth plates and stuff in puppies. Maybe they haven't completely closed. So my take on that would be if you've neutered your animal or they've, you know, you have a larger animal that's about around a year old, I'd say you can start <clears throat> exercising. And it really does depend on the type of exercise and how long. Like if you're going on a 10 mile run, then I'd let your dog mature a little bit more. You know, if you're going a you know, for a short one mile run, then it usually is fine. Okay, awesome. A uh, quick plug again for the viewers watching, doctor, where do you work at? Fairy Farm Animal Clinic. Okay, does your facility offer any assistance with microchipping or any assistance for the community with neutering or yeah, anything um, like that? You, uh, we microchip, we neuter, and we spay. We do lots of other 
medical procedures. Um, it really does depend. Full service. Full service. You, guys do, you said you do dental as well. Correct? We do dentals yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, what's uh, actually dental is a good question. Is again, my mouth's uh -huh. like eight, getting there. Um, do you guys do you guys see a lot of jacked up teeth in dogs? Yes, mm -hmm. and it really and, does too. Like depend on the breed. Like I have some Chihuahuas that are three years old that look. They have teeth that look like they're 12, you know, and then I have other dogs that are 14 years old that have great teeth. It really does, it's kind of genetic, just yeah, like with people. people yeah. Um, but yeah, we do, um, you know, it's the, kind of part of the grossest day, you know, we'll have dental day and some of just, the grossest things you see are on dental day. So the things that they can keep in their mouths. And um, to add to that, this is a question just for me okay. personally, but I'm sure a lot of people want to know is, like, what's your thought? Like, you know the greenies, right? Yeah. I'm giving you guys a free plug. Ooh. Um, <laughs> is, uh, on the greenies, are okay. they, do they actually work? Or do they have any actual yeah. benefit, well, you think? Like, so, generally, do, yeah. what do you think? My personal opinion, again, this is my own personal opinion, <laughs> but from what I've seen success-wise, is that the only thing that's going to help prevent dental disease in your animal is to actually brush their teeth. Um, people say once a day, but that's unrealistic. Yeah, even I don't have time to, for that. <laughs> once a week, if you can, they even have, you know, they have finger brushes with like toothpaste, flavored toothpaste at the Petco, PetSmart. If I've seen it really, a lot of success with it. Owners that are able to do that with their animal, that do that, have, they have the best teeth. You mean the people that are like Brush actually in. getting in there? Yeah. Um, I have some owners that do the greenies and it helps a little bit, but it's not the it's complete not. answer, yeah. unfortunately. And I don't think anything out there really is going to be. Well, I, I, I kind of look at it, maybe I'm wrong, but from a person perspective, yeah. I've never heard someone say, hey, Nick, it, to make your teeth nice, you can just chew this instead yeah. of brush your teeth every <laughs> yeah, day. Yeah, chew, so chew some gum. It's yeah. kind of like that. So I would know? assume it would be the same as a dog, yeah, right? Like exactly. our mouths are not that much different. Yeah. So. yeah. so it's not, it's certainly, what you're saying is, it's whether a, it works or not, it it's definitely help. not a replacement yes. for brushing your dog's yes. teeth. Uh, <laughs> if, if you're going to brush your dog's teeth, <laughs> which I'm not, but if you're going to, <laughs> can you use human toothpaste or is there... I mean... Okay, you can, but they're not going to like it, and they're going to hypersalivate, and they're going to shake everywhere, and they're going to get that reflex that makes them look like they have rabies, <laughs> and they're going to just, yeah, I usually like the flavored stuff. They tend to have a better reaction. The one time I did try to just use regular toothpaste on my cat, she completely <laughs> freaked out and was like, vomiting and foaming at the mouth and so, so just spring the six bucks and get yeah the, get, get the, the get the flavored chicken toothpaste for them why not <laughs> <laughs> um uh, got a question for you okay uh what about uh like raw hides for a teeth oh that's a good question or or uh, ropes like i've heard yeah. like the ropes like yeah. that helps floss their teeth Anything and... hard. i'm not a huge fan of raw hides because i've removed a lot of them mm. as foreign bodies yeah. so i'm like not a huge fan of actual rawhides. I like objects that are hard that they cannot swallow or, you know, break apart easily and get stuck. Um, so, you know, anything like that, even Kong sometimes help a little bit, but definitely something, a bone that's hard that they can chew on. But the problem with that is there's a, there's a fallback to that as well as I get a lot of chipped teeth because of that. Okay. What about uh, doctor about like uh, brushes for dogs like the uh -huh. Furminator. Do you have a specific one that you love that you use for your dogs? No, um, I've kind of had a lot of clients use a lot of different types and they all really work. Just, just, just brush your dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you have to do though, I mean, I have some owners that like certain brands and the others that like another brand. It's honestly what you like as an individual. You're the one that's going to have to do it every day. <laughs> okay. You recommend brushing daily? I mean, no. Is there any I benefit? Mean, re uh, really? Yeah, I mean, I have what I have a couple, very, very <laughs> few people, but a couple people that do do that. Can you tell? But it's usually some of my older. I mean, clients. is their coats like amazing looking or not? Really? Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it, if you're gung ho about it, why not? It really does. It's like brushing your hair; too. it doesn't hurt. Yeah, right? it depends <laughs> on the, the coat length as well. Um, a lot of people get professional groomers to do it too but um a, the more more often than not it's once 
to twice weekly is what I usually recommend. Okay. But I have people that do lots of different things. How often do you do it, Joe? Brush my dog? Never? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> weekly. <laughs> A weekly. We'll just say weekly. Every yeah. Friday. Yeah, every Friday. Um, at four. <laughs> at four. Um, back, going back to the anxiety, doctor, on uh, okay. with dogs. Say uh, uh, Fido's come through our training program. Um, we did everything we could. Uh, Anxiety still high, uh -huh. and Fido comes to see you. You put uh, Fido on Prozac. Uh -huh. Will Fido be on Prozac for the remainder of his life? Is there a weaning period? Okay. And if there is, how? Okay, so um, I usually recommend, especially if it's severe, I usually recommend a few years. I give uh -huh. them one to two year trial where they're on it all the time. Um, usually the same time of day as well. Um, and then of a week, you can start to decrease their dose. So, for instance, if your dog's on a twice daily dose, you over, you know, over a course of a couple days, start to give them one one pill once daily, et cetera, and then you go on to an every other day dose to wean them off slowly. Okay, very cool. Uh, here's a good question from Amanda. I like this question as well. <laughs> how do you feel How do you feel about antlers, uh, deer oh, antlers for dogs chewing them? Um, man, I've had, some deer. I've had a couple bad run-ins with deer antlers. Uh-oh, come on, you're breaking our um, hearts. Yeah, <laughs> come on, dog. But, I mean, they're okay. I mean, you know, I... I have some people that, that give their dog deer antlers, and that's fine. Um, they're better than some of the other types of bones. Would you say it's better than a rawhide? Yes. Okay, there oh. you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, worse, you know, sometimes they can get chipped teeth with it, but that's okay. And as long as it's big enough that they can't swallow, that's all I really care about, because I don't want to see you for that. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so on the, uh, the, the weight management issue, because we uh -huh. get that question and I always say, ask your vet. I'm yeah. not, I'm not a, uh, is, is there, do you generally, what do you see gets the most benefit? Is it, do you recommend like diet and exercise or is usually the diet, the it's main problem? Diet. So it's usually not an it's, exercise it's problem. It's the same, no, I okay. mean, it's the same thing in people. That's true. You know, I guess have, you can not exercise for being healthy. And you eat crap then you're you're not going to be healthy you know um so with with dogs i mainly say it's diet related diet. i mean if you exercise your dog with a diet that then you're certainly just, helps. like a person yeah i mean it certainly doesn't hurt but it's it's all diet with okay. dogs it really is and oh did you have a question joe i do okay go ahead uh real quick for you nick i, I think this is probably for you um uh, tiffany has a uh, a pit bull okay uh she wants to know uh, when she when she's out walking her dog, uh, he gets very distracted very easily, and it's hard to get his attention back. Do you have any tips? Any quick tips? I mean, really, distractions are solely an obedience issue. Yeah. Solely, I mean that that you know my my tip, kind of my trainer answer, but it's just the only, it's the real answer is you know what I always say when it when it comes to distraction work is people say my dog gets really distracted, and if you watch our seventeen hundred videos, you'll see that in 1700 before videos then you'll see their after video like i did ryan reynolds dog they're literally awfully shilling through times square and so what the, the to, to answer your question directly is when your dog is highly distracted and you're like heel heel and they're pulling my like trainer nick white answer is that tells me that your dog's level of obedience doesn't outweigh the distraction so meaning his obedience isn't good enough to outweigh the distraction which in turn the, the answer to that essentially, so the, the second part, the, the twofold answer, is how we get our dogs, and this is kind of a funny topic in itself, because people's like, oh my God, you know, I've watched so many of your videos, Times Square, DC, all of this, how do you get your dogs so good with distractions? I'm, I should, should I tell them the secret? Should I tell them Joe or no? Should I keep it to us? All right, I'll tell you guys a secret. You, how we get them there is we work the shit out of them with distractions. <laughs> That's the solution. I've never in my life seen a dog who is amazing in an empty field or in a facility, yes. and then they just healed flawlessly in Times Square. So the, the answer is work. start working your pit bull yeah. with distractions. I think I wrote a blog on this like a year ago at this point where I say if, if the only time you're – 
um, trying to get your dog to listen is around distractions and you never actually work them with distractions, they'll always be that way. So you have to make a very deliberate effort to take your dog out and work them around distractions. Maybe you can take your pit bull outside of a dog park because I'm a huge advocate against dog parks. So take him outside of a dog park and work him around there to get him desensitized to distractions and then it makes it so much easier to transition. But if you're only working your dog in your neighborhood and a distraction just so happens to show up, you'll always have that issue. You have, there, there's no secret other than make a dog amazing with distractions other than working with distractions. And it has to be, it's like socialization, it should be ongoing as well. You can't do it for two weeks and never do it again and expect in three years they're just as amazing. It has to be ongoing. Um, we have another question? No? Yeah, let's see here. Uh, any way to prevent an ear hematoma? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I actually saw a really bad ear hematoma recently. Um, so a lot of the times the primary issue with an ear hematoma is an ear infection. What happens is the dog shakes its head or scratches at it. Most of the time it's shaking of the head. Um, and then in between their skin and their cartilage, they break little micro vessels. And then they have a blood filled ear that has that needs to be drained um, prevention is to clean ears regularly uh, I'd say once a week um, and then if you notice an ear infection or you notice any head shaking or scratching or rubbing or any kind of irritation um, go to your vet because most of the time it's an ear infection um, and then we can fix it if it has a hematoma so a good question for me to add on that is what do you recommend uh, you clean your dog's ears with? Like cotton ball? like? Oh, um, you have to be careful because I've had to remove a couple of those. <laughs> People so, got down too deep in yeah, there. Yeah, I've had a lot recently for some reason. Um, so what I would probably do, I sometimes recommend a 4x4 four four gauze. And I, wrap, I say wrap it around your finger and then you stick your finger down in there. And that way, the gauze is still wrapped around your finger. Okay, yeah, so you can't lose Yeah, it. and a lot of the times, too, if you do it regularly, the solution that you put in there helps. Well, that's that's kind of my next question. Yeah. What solution um, would you recommend? We sell epiotic solution at our clinic, but there's a new one that we just started selling. So that. no, like, rubbing alcohol or anything mm -hmm. like I don't, that? I don't recommend the home remedies. No. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. It's yeah. like, oh, I use a conswab, no. rubbing alcohol. Sometimes, I've had a couple people actually cause infections with that. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, because it sometimes changes, because they have, all dogs have in their skin, in, they have natural yeast and bacteria. So sometimes if you change their environment, and it, it allows an overload it. to happen, you know, like yeast kind of kind of overloads their ear and they'll get a yeast to infection. Make up for. Yeah, so I usually recommend, you know, the buy it the from legit your bed. Stuff. Yeah, the legit <laughs> stuff, yeah. And I, I recommend four by four gauze. Some people tr say, well, can I just stick a Q-tip down and I've had a couple of those get lost as well. And sometimes too, if they move, they can break it off. So be really careful at home, and just do what you are, you know, what you are comfortable with, and be cautious in that regard. Okay, here's one for you: advice on joint supplements. Uh, what do you recommend, and what at what age do you recommend? So we kind of touched on this earlier, but um, it really does depend on the breed. If you have a giant breed, I usually recommend maybe as early as six, five or six. Um, some dogs that are maybe, you know, smaller breed that, you know, 10. Um, but it, some dogs need it earlier if they have a tendency to form degenerative joint disease early. Um, the products that we like, um, there's so many out there really. Um, pretty much any of them are sufficient as long as they have chondroitin and glucosamine in them. So if you find a product that has both of those components, then any of them are really going to be sufficient. Um, but Honestly, you can't ever hurt your animal by putting them on a joint supplement. So if you want to do it earlier, then you're fine. It doesn't prevent arthritis. It just kind of slows that progression a little bit. And guys, we're going to probably take one or two more questions. If anyone out there has any other uh, training related or medical related questions, um, we'll probably take just one or two more and then we are going to be ending our Facebook Live. So. Do we have any any other questions out there in uh, Facebook Live land tank? Uh, while I'm looking, here's one from earlier. We talked about, or you talked about, um, you'd normally put them on a trial for one to two years for uh, anxiety. Uh -huh. What's the side effects of them missing um, 
you know, one day or a week? What's those side effects? Really, um, again, very dog dependent. Some dogs don't miss a beat. Um, others can have um, kind of a, you know, behavioral differences. Some dogs can get really agitated, anxious. Um, and then, you know, sometimes too, you can get some GI signs like vomiting, diarrhea, um, if you abruptly start them again after they've been off of it. Um, but a lot of times they can get a little bit anxious if they haven't had that. So I, my best advice in that regard would be if you have skipped a dose or even a week, call your vet first, have an exam done, and then, you know, you and the vet can then decide what is needed to do at that point. Awesome. Is that all we got? Uh, here's a good question from Trish out in Portland. Uh, shout out to them. It says, what's a good eye cleaning solution, since we talked about ears, what's a good eye cleaning solution to have on hand to flush out eyes? Maybe contact lens cleaner, would uh, that work? Um, <laughs> you know, I've had some owners use that. Um, even artificial tears, really, is fine. Nothing else, really. Um, <laughs> I would probably re kind of steer away from anything major, um, just because if your dog has you know, an ulcer or anything like that, that can make those situations worse. So artificial tears, you can, you can definitely put in your dog's eye and that'd be fine. Is it true for kennel cough, you can give a little Robitussin DM and call it a day? <laughs> Man, I don't even know if we want to get into that. <laughs> you would not recommend that? Um, I mean, See a vet about it? That would certainly help. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it depends on the cough, too, because you so it depends again, on the dog age of the dog. Dependent. It really is, because if you get a, a dog that gets kennel cough and, you know, they're really old, they have a tendency then to then get something really bad like pneumonia. So they need potentially an legit, antibiotic. Legit or, stuff. Yeah, and, you know, it really does depend on the cough, because if it's wet, then I don't want to suppress a cough. I guess it's, it's, it's kind of like... A person. Yes. It's like I have a really yeah. bad cold. Take this. It's like, oh shit, you had pneumonia. Yes. You're glad you went to the doctor, yes, right? Exactly. So, so I mean, thing. it really does depend. I mean, most dogs kind of get over, you know, kennel cough. Just like a person. Yeah, it's refractory. They can get over it on their own, but I personally prefer when they come to me. And I okay, so <laughs> that that answers that question. Do we have any more tank? Uh, yeah, one from Joe. Looks like he doesn't want to fight the Northern Virginia traffic getting down to your. Uh, facility. He wants to know up in Woodbridge and above. Is there any recommendations for uh, any vets up there? Um, we deal a lot with Woodbridge Animal Clinic. Um, they're quite good, um, and they have a lot of really good emergency services. And we actually have a veterinarian that works with us. That's a coworker of mine that used to work up there. Cool. All right, guys, so we appreciate all of your comments, and we especially thank Dr. Horrocks uh, for being with us. If you are in the Northern Virginia area, you can uh, schedule appointments with her at Fairy Farm Animal Clinic. Yes. And uh, what's the website there? Do you know? Um, it's fairyfarmanimalclinic.com. Oh, there you go, <laughs> fairyfarmanimalclinic.com. You can also find them on Facebook. And uh, we greatly appreciate her coming here to take the time to set with all of you and answer all of your amazing questions. I think Joe yeah. said that every question was yeah. a really good question. <laughs> yeah. So we greatly appreciate it, guys. And again, check her out at Fairy Farm Animal Clinic. That's Dr. Horrocks, and she will take great care of you and your <laughs> pet. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at 7.30. And we have other cool stuff lined up for you. So tune in next Wednesday, and thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs>